Oh man, I still love watching that intro. What is going on, guys? It is your boy Tiki the Orange here, back in here on PlayStation Source. And if you can see me right now, you know I'm nice and comfy. It is uh, approximately 10:22 p.m. on Saturday night. Yes, uh, this is going live. I hope it does. You know, the morning after I record this. But as you can tell, I am indeed by myself. This happens from time to time. You know, what I'm saying I did have a guest lined up. Maybe he will show up at a later episode of Final Fantasy VII Remake because I do really want. Uh, to have him on or have someone that is a similar uh you know type of style that that uh, he is but before i even begin to continue rambling on this is of course road to final Fantasy VII remake the weekly podcast series leading up to release of final Fantasy VII remake on april 10th or april 3rd pretty sure april 10th pretty sure april 10th i think april 3rd is resident evil 3 i keep getting those two mixed up but i digress uh i will be uh here alone with you and i do have you know i got some water I got a glass of wine, we're going to be sipping some of the wine, and we're going to talk a little bit about why Final Fantasy VII Remake is so important, right? And I wanted, you know, to have someone on the show that played it and was alive and was a gamer during that time of its release, and I was going to, you know, just, just go through with some facts and stuff like that, and maybe, you know, a future episode will come up that is similar to this one that we're, uh, that we're about to have, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I can get someone that has that same context, because I certainly don't. I have never played Final Fantasy VII. Uh, I, have, I have played the demo, like you guys seen the channel, and I have not played the original. Uh, let me just uh, check a chip of water. So I'd like to hopefully get someone else on uh, the, you know, the Road to Final Fantasy VII Remake podcast uh, to be able to just give us some context to that standpoint. But uh, I figured I'd just pull some Wikipedia facts, which I did here myself. I, I have my Google Doc open. And uh, I'm going to just read off what exactly makes Final Fantasy VII so unique in in its overall just gravitas and how much it means to a lot of people. So obviously, it is no secret. Final Fantasy VII is a huge game. Uh, it, it, is, it is a game that, you know, while me have never playing a Final Fantasy game, understand the importance of Final Fantasy VII and like how much it did uh you know for for games overall you know what I'm saying like a lot of people talk about Final Fantasy VII in a similar vein of like The Last of Us how I feel about Last of Us and like you know about like for me personally Last of Us I feel like games intrinsically changed after The Last of Us and I feel like overall it, it, it like seems like it was a similar effect with Final Fantasy 7 and the fact of how much of a leap this was how many people's first JRPG this was it you know coming to the West in a big way and stuff like that and so it, it it's really really a big deal right so and and of course I would hope a lot of you listening to this maybe already know that and if you don't maybe I can convince you on its importance uh, via this episode and so i tell this one just the history so this is just simply going over the final fantasy 7 history uh and we're talking of course here about the playstation 1 version of course uh back in the day and so just read some facts here the initial release date was at some point in 1996 but to properly realize their vision and their being square uh square postponed the release date almost a full year so of course as we see today in games delays are no uh, you know rarity if you will they, they they definitely did happen back in the day and they continue to happen now as well and so uh, What I found interesting here was that a re-release of the game based on its western version titled Final Fantasy 7 International was released on October 2nd 1997 this improved international version would kickstart the trend for square to create an updated version for the Japanese release based on the enhanced western versions so it looks like Final Fantasy 7 was released first in the eastern territories of the world and then came to the west where we got it on PlayStation 1 and you know stuff like that and it seems like they took the game that they put out in the western version uh i mean not 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 version the western territory and brought it over to the east side uh once again in a re-release fashion so it looks like uh, that was a trend that they were doing where they would you know first initially launch like we'll call it like version one or one or like the or, or, or like the beta version of final fantasy or any other game and they bring it over uh you know a more enhanced version to the western countries and then re-release it on the back home uh, where it where they dropped the original beta version quote-unquote not actually a beta But you know the version that's not as enhanced as the Western version it would bring the Western version over back home to those that uh, 
are in the eastern territory so pretty interesting to see that there but at least here in the states and like here on the western territory of the world it was released officially on january 31st 1997 developed by square yes and so i'm not i'm not just saying square enix just for short uh originally they were just called square and sometimes they would call themselves squaresoft at times i couldn't you know i couldn't get a whole reason as to why they would call themselves square versus squaresoft but that's just one of the things that they did and they now are obviously referred to as Square Enix as when they bought Enix, they combined two names and made Square Enix and stuff like that. Uh, and then of course, Square Enix, Square Enix, excuse me, is the current uh, name of the team, of course, that is developing 587 Remake. So really cool to see that, uh, you know, while while we almost got 587 Remake by another dev, which is of course for a whole other episode of the series, it's nice to know that, you know, at least... It, it was brought back internally to be developed uh, by the same company that did the original, right? So, th so that's always good to hear. Uh, it was released, of course, on the original PlayStation, but, but was originally planned for the SNES when development started in 1984. So this, I found the most interesting about this whole look back at 587, you know, as, as an iconic uh, game and as the PS1 version, was that there were a lot of difficulties uh you know with with this game's development right and it was very interesting to see that because most times in games today we don't really have an issue where at least i feel like it's not really that prominent where we have games that uh you know are are in the middle of development and still wondering which hardware they're going to eventually land on like i feel like you know that that just doesn't happen but with 587 that was the complete opposite and, and, and there's a bunch of reasons why it was happening where they were testing different copies on uh you know playstation uh you know and that upcoming console they were testing on snes there was even some more that i'll list you know as we go on down the bullet points that i made from the 587 wikipedia but it's a very it's a very unique development cycle that i i feel like doesn't really happen that much in the modern day in terms of uh you know this 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 like singular game being tested on the both of different hardware uh and and you know trying to just try on like it's it's different shoe like it's like it's almost like the the game and square were kind of like window shopping different uh you know different type of consoles or different type of machines and uh let's just go on that so the main thing was that after delays and technical difficulties from experimenting on several platforms, Square moved production to the PlayStation largely due to advantages of the CD-ROM format. So the biggest thing was the CD-ROM, right? And so a big thing that you know you you gotta take in take into account with Final Fantasy VII was that it was the first Final Fantasy to use 3D computer graphics over 2D rendered backgrounds, and so it was their first like foyer into 3D on the Final Fantasy series, and so they had a big like uh, a big. A big issue with either making 587 run on a 2D format and run on you know uh, different consoles that were more fat, more more in tune with the uh, 2D art style and 2D rendering uh, techniques and stuff like that, or if they wanted to make that leap as the industry was was shifting towards 3D, uh, you know a big back and forth during development was to make 587 either a 2D game, which would be easier, or take a risk and go 3D on newer hardware. As you know that that like 3d shift was was coming into form in the industry and so it was a big kind of like tug of war it seems like and a lot of people were a part of that internally uh, and and it was a whole thing but eventually they landed of course on the PlayStation but before they even decided on landing on PlayStation they were testing out versions on N64 on Sega Saturn Microsoft Windows NES as well of course and you know they were they were testing if they wanted it to run on cartridges but during that time as well cartridges started to rise and increase in the amount that it was cost them to produce them at that rate that they wanted to sell the game at and different stuff like that as opposed to cd-rom which was which was a lot cheaper during that time and you know just increasingly more cheaper and more readily available as the years went on as opposed to cartridge based games uh so of course facing both technical and economic issues on the nintendo's current hardware and impressed by the increased storage capacity of the cd-rom when compared to the n64 cartridge square shifted development off 7 
and all other planned projects onto the PlayStation. So it looks like they were kind of hesitant to make that shift onto the CD-ROM and onto PlayStation, but eventually they did. And I want to kind of read a little bit here off the Wikipedia directly uh, because uh, it was it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, that they had. I, I mean, I read right here. So what happened was their decision was influenced by two factors a highly successful tech demo based on Final Fantasy 7 I mean Final Fantasy 6 excuse me using the uh, soft image 3d software and the escalating price of cartridge based games which was limiting Square's audience tests were made for an n64 version which would use the planned 64 DD peripheral despite the lack of 64 DD development kits and the prototype device uh, and and the prototype devices changing hardware specifications this version was discarded during early testing as a 2000 poly needed to render the behemoth monster place ex excessive strain on the n64 hardware causing a low frame rate it would require an estimated 30 64 dd discs to run five by seven properly with the data compression methods of the day and so it, it was it was going to cost them a lot and be a huge undertaking to be able to have five by seven on the n64 like like they they tried and you know with the rising cost of cartridges it, it just wasn't you know it just wasn't going to work out and it's very interesting to see this you know type of this these these type of issues with with development because this was their version of like cross-gen you know games in a way and like trying to figure out which platform they should you know prefer or which platform they should develop on uh and so it was really interesting to see that you know how much of a difference and and 64 was of course to the original playstation back in the day but ultimately you know playstation was able to uh you know win them over uh with their cd-rom technology and and uh, stuff like that so overall uh it was a good thing and you gotta think too like they could have easily just taken a step back and not done any 3d for 5 ac7 but you know with them wanting to do 3d and wanting to you know shift shift the overall uh not 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 i guess format of the game but the aesthetic of the game and be able to incorporate 3d it was it was all thanks to playstation so shout out you know to playstation under uh under that whole thing and stuff like that so uh was interesting thing to know as well about the game is that it had a staff of over 100 people with a combined development and marketing budget of around 80 million usd and so with 100 people on staff they developed final fantasy 7 and of course that development and marketing budget is combined so for 80 million back in the day however i did get a chance to do some research and i did adjust the inflation price of what it would be in 2020 and that would be about 130 million dollars in 2020 which you know when 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 we have games like destiny that came out i believe in 2014 2015 i think something like that uh or or, or maybe so back as 2013 i know it was definitely post 2013 i think 2014 was the year destiny came out but that game of course infamously was 500 million dollars to develop and i believe market as well i believe i could be wrong on that but you know i just you know that that like whole meme was you know destiny 500 million dollars to you know develop that game and stuff like that half a billion dollars uh so you know we have major games like that but a game close to the same budget that final Fantasy 7 would have been if it was developed in the same way same circumstances today in 2020 would be dead space 2 which uh was at a a 136 million of course a, a and of course that number as well is adjusted for inflation for 2020 so that 136 million is adjusted for inflation as well so that's kind of what it would look like uh if if so so if the if dead space 2 and 587 were developed today that's about the adjusted for inflation price point that it would both be like they would both be close together which is pretty interesting to see how we got 587 for that amount of money as the same as dead space 2 and i feel like a lot of people don't love dead space 2 as much as does as much as dead space 1 but i digress and so uh of course we were talking about a big back and forth in development and during development was making the game either 2d or 3d and different stuff like that but of course that got all alleviated with the good old playstation and 
In contrast to the visuals and audio, the overall gameplay systems remain mostly unchanged for Final Fantasy V and VI, but with an emphasis on player control. The initial decision was for battles to feature shifting camera angles. Battle arenas had a lower polygon count than field areas, which made creating distinctive features more difficult. The summon sequences benefited strongly from the switch to the cinematic style as the team had had struggled to portray their scale using 2D graphics. And so I believe also like the overall ambition behind uh you know what the developers wanted to do with final fantasy 7 and and like how they wanted to kind of take final fantasy as as an ip and as a franchise of games to a whole nother level in terms of showing off like they say here in this wikipedia excerpt like this this scale of different features and stuff like that and, and you know overall just 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 scale of everything really in a given game was hard to portray on 2d like like it's hard to do a lot of things you know it's hard to do a lot of things in 2d obviously and so i think it was very noble of them uh to you know have this vision and do this you know new and innovative type of development style and type of game that they were creating that was definitely not what the original Final Fantasies were back in the day every Final Fantasy before 7 uh, them having of course 2D art styles and I think it's really interesting too that they they wanted to they you know up of course the visuals and the audio and stuff like that but they wanted to keep the core gameplay the same which i think is really interesting but they also of course wanted to put an emphasis on player control which uh you know when you when you look at final fantasy gameplay it it almost looks like two different games like like when you're in battle it looks like an entirely different game as opposed to when you're uh, given the ability to walk around and uh uh you know your like 3d you know uh your 3d sprite that of course being cloud strife uh, you know walking around in these 2d's in these 2d's environment in these 2d environments I cannot talk in these 2d environments uh, It looks it looks a little bit jarring honestly like it looks weird But of course for that time it was incredible and stuff like that So overall, you know, it was amazing But while you know this studio had all this ambition and had all of this uh, uh you know these these aspirations to make Final Fantasy 7 bigger than what any other Final Fantasy 7 would have been. Square was uncertain about the game's success, as other JRPGs, including Final Fantasy 6, had met with poor sales outside of Japan. So it looks like, you know, it, it, it maybe was a little bit more of like not only did they want to do something different, they probably had to do something different. You know, considering that all these JRPGs outside of uh, you know, Japan weren't selling that much, and they were and, and they were met, and they were met with poor sales and stuff like that. It seems like they wanted to take Final Fantasy VII and really do something big with this title, even though they were uncertain about the game's success due to their past track record in releasing other JRPGs and probably other other you know Final Fantasy VII. I mean, not other Final Fantasy VII's, other Final Fantasy games outside of Japan. Uh, so it it. it it just tells you like there's plenty of proof on the on the wall that you know that that this game was was a pivotal moment in square i feel like you know like obviously this game was a pivotal moment in games as a whole you know what i'm saying but let's talk a little bit about how the game ended up selling and stuff like that with Final Fantasy 7 so Within three days of its release in Japan, Final Fantasy VII sold over 2 million copies. This popularity inspired thousands of retailers in North America to break street dates in September to meet public demand for the title. In the game's debut weekend in North America, it sold 33... 33... Wow, I cannot talk. Thir wow. Kevin, you alright? You alright, Kev? You good? Okay, let's, let's read this number without slipping up, okay? Let's go. 330,000 copies and had reached sales of 500,000 copies in less than three weeks. The, the momentum established in the game's opening weeks continued for several months. Sony announced the game had sold 1 million copies in North America by early December. As of 2019, the game has sold over 12.3 million units worldwide. And so, obviously, those numbers 
are uh, pretty telling, of course, of, 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 you know, how big this game was. And, uh, you know, I wish I wish it was around for this, right? But I was approximately negative one years old. I busted on the scene on 1998. So uh, I, I just barely missed it, actually. I mean, Final Fantasy VII came out in North America in September. I came out <laughs> like I was talking to myself like like if I was a like like if I was a game dropping like I I was released on uh, February of 1998 so uh, I just barely missed it but uh, it looks like Final Fantasy VII was a huge hit you know and and I would love to you know and I know there was some other stuff in Wikipedia about how um, they had you know demos of this game at different trade shows and I believe at E3 as well I believe question mark I think but I I know they had demos out in the wild. Uh, you know, before release, and so I wonder if that was just word of mouth traveling as to how big this game got. Of course, I'm assuming the marketing budget would ha had a big deal, you know, to do with it as well. Of course, it was one of the premier launch title, not not like launch title, but one of the premier games overall on PlayStation. Like, like it, it like you gotta think, you know, uh, PlayStation was one of the first consoles to have. The capability to render you know 3d you know uh, uh games and stuff like that of course likely not the first one but but one of the f most prominent uh, uh ones to do that and stuff like that you know so to have uh you know a brand new console a brand new game that has capabilities that are not seen on any other platform uh it, it overall just makes sense you know like like it like if it's almost as if like Final Fantasy VII was indeed like the PlayStation One's, uh, you know, like launch, you know, premiere IP, like your your like banger new IP to go alongside your console, you know, like it it definitely feels and like when you look back on it, it it's similar to that, you know, what I'm saying at least from what it looks, right? So as we kind of wrap up, I know it's a little bit of a shorter episode, but. It's just by myself, guys. What do you want me to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I did have, uh, you know, someone else on. But, again, maybe maybe he, he'll be on in a future episode. But Wikipedia has approximately four paragraphs about the awards Final Fantasy VII has received. And, honestly, kind of want to read it all to you. And, likely, I might just do that to end this episode. So, why not take it off with how many rewards, I mean, not rewards, awards Final Fantasy VII has garnered over the years. So, Final Fantasy VII was given numerous Game of the Year awards in 1997. It won in the Academy of, of Interactive Arts and Sciences, first annual Interactive Achievement Awards in categories of Console Adventure Game of the Year and Console Role Playing Game of the Year. It was also nominated in categories Interactive Title of the Year, Outstanding Achievement in Arts and Graphics, Outstanding Achievement in Interactive Design as well. In the Origins Award, it won in the category of Best Role Playing Computer Game of 1997. It was also awarded the Reader's Choice All Systems Game of the Year, Reader's Choice PlayStation Game of the Year, and Reader's Choice Role Playing Game of the Year by EGM, which also gave it other awards for quote the Haas video game Babe. Wow, okay. That's that's a uh, huh. Huh. Would you would you look at that? <laughs> Hottest video game babe for Tifa Lockhart and most hyper for a game best ending, best print act as well, which print act, I don't know, I don't know what the, oh, print ad, excuse me, print ad, like an advertisement, okay, gotcha, since, since 1997, it has been selected by many game magazines as one of the top video games of all time, listed as 91st in EGM's 2001's 100 best games of all time, and as 4th in, in retro games, uh, top 100 games in 2004, so it ranked number 4 in the top 100 of that top 100 list in 2004. In 2018, it was ranked 99th in IGN's Top 100 Games of All Time, and as 3rd in uh, Palgan's The Greatest 100 Games Ever, Final Fantasy VII was included in The Greatest Games of All Time, listed by GameSpot in 2006, and ranked as 2nd in Empire's 2006 100 Games, 100 Greatest Games of All Time, and as, as 3rd in Stuff's 100 Greatest Games in 2008, and as 15th in Game Informer's 2009, the top 200 games of all time, down five places from its previous best games of all time list. GameSpot placed it as the second most influential game ever made in 2002. In 2007, Game Pro ranked it 14th on the list of the most important games of all time in 2009, and it finished in the same place, uh, place on their list on the most innovative games of all time. In 2012, Time named it one of 
their quote all time the 100 video games in March 2018. Game Informer's Real Choice top 300 games of all time. Final Fantasy ranked in the seventh. Wow, so it, it ranked seven place on Game Informer's Real Choice top top 300 games of all time. So that's that's bold. That's a lot. In March 2018, Games Radar rated uh, the 25 best PS1 games of all time, and Final Fantasy VII was ranked in 12th place. They also appeared in numerous other greatest games list in 2007. Uh, PlayStation gave it the best story, best RPG, best overall game retrospective awards for games on the original PlayStation. Game Pro named it the best RPG tile of all time in 2008 and featured it in their 2010 article, The 30 Best PSN Games. In 2012, Game Radar also ranked it as the sixth saddest game at Wow, saddest game ever. Interesting. On the other hand, GameSpy ranked it. it Game Spy ranked it seventh on the 2003 list of most overrated games. Interesting. So we got some uh, some interesting stuff here. Like apparently, Five Eight Seven is really sad. Apparently, some people think it's overrated. Five Eight Seven has often placed it at or near the top of many uh, reader polls of all time based of all time best games. It was voted the rear's choice game of the century in an IGM poll in 2000 and placed second in the top 100 favorite games of all time by Japanese magazine Famitsu in 2006. It was also voted as ninth in Famitsu 2011 poll most most tier most wait what is that word most T E A R O oh, tear inducing games of all time. I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. I'm 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 a massive dummy. Okay. Tear inducing games of all time. Users of GameFAQs voted it the best game ever in 2004 and in 2005 and placed it in second in 2009. In 2008, readers of uh, this one magazine, <laughs> I can't read that, voted it the best game ever made as well as the ninth most tear inducing game of all time so i just spoke for about what two or three minutes straight on how many awards 5 c 7 has gotten it's clear this game is special this game is important i personally cannot wait to be able to play the remake and honestly i feel like there might become i mean like there 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 might be a point i feel like when i beat 5 7 remake right that i'll just go back and play the original to get the full story i feel like i'm not gonna be able to resist the story if it's you know being called tear tear inducing sad and all the good stuff i'm a sucker for uh for at least what the lore they've established in the demo, right? I cannot wait to go in and see more on that standpoint. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, episode two would, didn't really turn out how I wanted to. But, hey, I'm glad uh, I got to have a little conversation with you, the audience, about Final Fantasy VII. And if you have any other input to bring to the topic about the Final Fantasy VII that is from a historical standpoint, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and make sure also while you are down there to check our description where you can find our twitter our discord as well as our anchor link to listen to our long form content as well as this podcast in podcast format that of course being road to part two road to five is every remake as well as saves hot podcast down below in the description you can find the anchor link to go to our apple podcast link google play spotify all the good stuff where you can find our podcast feed down below below or if you want to search playstation source podcast feed you can do that as well make sure to leave a like on the video as well as subscribe to playstation source keep up with the latest and grace in playstation thank you for watching and as always greatness awaits